start hearing us. God bless everyone. Thank you for connecting. Those who send us messages through Messenger, Facebook, Zoom, whichever platform you're using, uh, thank you for connecting with us. Uh, also, the brothers and sisters and family members and loved ones that connect through Zoom. Uh, today, we're you know, kind of uh, entering a new realm. Uh, as far as material goes, last Monday we finished speaking about the Tetragrammaton, which I do not know how to pronounce it in English, even though they tell me it's the same. Mm -hmm. It's called the Tetragrammaton, yeah. uh, but I feel like I'm speaking in tongues when I say it, so I <laughs> try not to repeat words that I don't really dominate. But uh, yeah, but definitely uh, it's been it's been a blessing, and today we're gonna kind of try to discuss a little bit. Uh, in reference of what it means to find God. Um, and if you haven't connected with us before, or if you have, you're going to notice that I kind of like to anchor myself on relationships. Um, and that's kind of, that means a lot to me, because I know when I was young, I struggled with the identity of God and knowing if, even if he was real, even though I grew up in a Christian family, I, you know, and I saw the movement and I saw the atmosphere, I still struggle with that. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't, I remember one day my uh, a friend of mine, he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a lot older than I was back then. His name was Nicky Miel, as God bless you, uh, if he ever watches this video. I remember he pulled me into the car, and he just used a very simple word, phrase. He said, he told me, your issue is that you want to know and meet your creator. And he kind of pinpointed for me, because that's exactly what I was struggling with. I, I didn't want to just anchor my belief system on words on a page. And, and that's why you'll notice that in a lot of my sermons and messages, I'm kind of just kind of guiding people to make that connection with God. You know, don't just take it for what we're saying, but, you know, take the time to, to you know, to speak to God and, and just have a one-on-one -on -one with God. And I, I can promise you that you're not going to regret it. Once again, those who are connected through, uh, through social media, if you decide that you wish to connect with us through Zoom and interact with us, in an audio level, you can. Uh, the ID number is on the screen. Let's do a quick prayer before we anchor ourselves in the class. Um, I still have people connecting. Uh, let's do a quick prayer. I'll, I'll take it this time because I know last Sunday, last Monday, you were intimidated by it. <laughs> let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you one more time for your presence, for the power of your word. We thank you for the blessing that we have to come together, Father, even if it's in these different platforms, to just allow your word to shine upon us, to shine the light of knowledge and wisdom, to get to know you at a more intimate level. We pray for everyone that's at the reach of my voice, that they may be ministered through your word and that you may continue to honor them and strengthen them and answer the questions that they may have in their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Well, quickly, just just, just a recap uh, for those uh, who, are, who are new to connecting with us. It uh, doesn't matter if you're in social media or, or, or Messenger or whatever platform you're using. Our style of, of, uh, of ministering or teaching is what we call dynamic. So if you feel like asking a question or bringing a comment, don't hesitate. Just ask it. Just That's, that's how we teach. We kind of like well, what I call an open dialogue. If you see our Sunday school classes in church, it's actually a, an open dialogue in a platform with the congregation and a few people on the pulpit just having a conversation of, you know, whatever topic it is. As long as we stay within the topic. I mean, yeah. if, if we're teaching about love and you ask me about the, you know, the, 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 the three kings and, you know, in the book of Matthew, then I might tell you, you know, we'll answer that later. But but just to stay on topic um, or anything that we may have covered in the past few recent classes. But anyway, so. I want to cover today uh, a topic that, like I said earlier, is close to my heart and is basically finding God in a lost world. Uh, finding God in a lost world. Last Sunday, I was ministering to the church yesterday, and when I was praying in the office, God brought to my mind uh, a, a, a phrase that I had read in a book decades ago, and I honestly don't even remember who the author is. I think it's Mark something. But uh, I remember that, that he said uh, in the phrase, he uses this phrase that says, you know, there are two important days in a man's life. And he's speaking unisex. Uh, and it's the day that he's born and the day he finds out why. 
He's just let that kind of uh, reminisce. The day he's born and the day we find out why. Uh, and that's something that ministered me closely yesterday, and I shared it with the congregation. Uh, because the moment you have that encounter, uh, it gives you a level of stability and security that you know which route, which direction you're headed. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the, 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 the pivot points that I like to uh, kind of pinpoint is how important it is, Sister Miriam, for, for us to strive to reach yeah. that perspective or that encounter with God. You know, it's not just simply a thought in your mind or, you know, um, a phrase that you use every now and then or when you walk in front of a, a, a Christian church. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's about having that, that spiritual structure, that intimate relationship, and just not, not thinking God is real, yeah. but knowing God is real. One of the things, Brother Ruben, that um, it brings me to my mind when I read, you know, the theme, finding God in the lost, the lost world, it makes me like uh, think, like in situations that I, I have been like, um, it has been like a big crowd, and finding me myself in a big crowd, but at the same time, feeling like alone. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I don't know how to explain, but it's like. It could be a lot of people around me, but like my mind is not in in everybody. You know, my mind is like it's you. Just, you still feel like like and, like and, I'm lost. Like 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 I, I even though there's people talking, there's people doing this, people that, but I, I I'm like in my own world, feeling lost. Yeah, you know, I, that, I, that's I, all I can define. And I and when I, I see finding God in the lost world. And and I think, Sister Miriam, that that's something that. We all go through. Yeah. One of the, when I bring, you know, seminars on matrimonies or when I counsel matrimonies, I always tell them that, uh, you know, I love my wife. We've been together for close to 25 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've been together more than 25 years. We've been married for 24, 24 and a half. 24, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been together for another five years, which is 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 29 mm -hmm. years. And, 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 and I consider her my best friend. Uh, there's nobody else in this world. That I'm closer to than my wife. Why are you smiling? Because I remember when you used to tell my kids, when the kids used to come from, from school when they were little, they're like, oh, papi, you know my best friend? You were like, there's no just, such a thing as best friend. I'm your best friend. Your mom is your best friend. That's true. And I still believe that. You know, because it, the interpretation of what the world it's says a best friend that. is, you know, it, it's not real. <laughs> and it, you know, it's it's not real. Your parents, you know, your parents, and and there's very. If you find yourself, I tell my kids this. Now that she brought that up, I tell my kids this. I tell them, learn to love the people that tell you what you need to hear, yeah. not what you want to hear. Yeah. Those are your friends. Yeah. Those are your friends. The people that tell you know the truth. will risk their relationship with you to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know. Uh. But anyway, you know. So. Uh, I, I I just lost my my, my chain of thought. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I was saying work. that I was saying that my my so I, I love my wife. We have a really good, beautiful relationship, and I thank God for it every day. Uh, but even even so, uh, I still have to tell when I when I teach this topic and give matrimony advice is your wife is not always going to be there for you. Yeah. That's your true. husband, as much as he loves you. He's not going to be there. He's not going to understand you all the time. You know, we're two different consciences and we're two different minds. Two different people. You know, they're not going to, there are certain things that you just can't share with everybody. Sometimes not even your spouse or your parents. I love my parents to death. Those of you who know me know I have a really close relationship with my dad and my mom. And, uh, but there are things that I don't just tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the beautiful thing about this is that 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 creates a void mm -hmm. in us that sometimes we feel like we're just drowning in our own loneliness yeah. or our own sorrow or our own struggles because we really can't like relate with somebody and i believe firmly that god allows that or intentionally dictates that specifically because 
What he's trying to do is that there's a void inside all of us that yeah. only he could fill. Yeah. Only Jesus Christ. He's the only one. You know, and I love my wife, like I was saying earlier, but I know that there are certain things that only God understands. And and it's vice versa. I have to understand that my wife is a is an independent human being who has a heart and a conscience and has desires and, and struggles that as much as I want to be there for her 100%, I know only God. You understand and, and that's why this topic to me is so close. So we're going to kind of cover, and I want to invite you, those of you who are, you know, following us, uh, you know, let's go to the second book of Chronicles chapter 15. And before we read it, I want to uh, quickly just give a brief, you know, recap of what's actually happening here. Uh, Israel had already been pulled away from uh, from 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 the from Egypt, the Egyptians. Excuse me. They they had already converted into a nation. They had already had an army. They had already fought battles. They had already. I mean, you know, they have passed through so many years of of God had blessed them. They were they were already living in the land that God had promised Abraham. So they had crossed the Jordan. They, you know, they, they were already a blessed nation. They weren't the fragile Israel that was in oh, Egypt yeah. and that didn't know God. You know, that had already surpassed. Matter of fact, a matter of fact, they had even they already had even established or built the temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. So you know, we're, we're talking about a more mature Israel, which is the nation of God in the Old Testament or in ancient times. Now, uh, listen to how God approaches them in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 15. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask Brother Martinez, if he doesn't mind, if you can see it, Brother, if you want to read it for us, we'd appreciate it. Amen. And Jesus is saying, uh, Now, for a long season, Israel had been without the truth, God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. But when they, in their trouble, did turn unto the Lord of God of Israel and saw them, he was found of them. So, yeah. so kind of let's let's create a small foundation here, right? Uh, what had happened was uh, it's telling us that, and it uses a phrase that a long time had passed. Mm -hmm. that, that when you when you when you see the phrase in the Bible Israel or Israelites, you could interpret that as the the children of God. God's people, the, the nation of God, the people that should know better, basically, you know, uh, and what, what it's basically kind of painting a picture for us is that it uses the phrase that a long period had passed where these, this nation in particular, this era was living, and it uses the phrase without a true God, mm -hmm. and then it says without teachings of a priest, in other words, they had the temple. But they, they weren't hearing the word of God. They had the sanctuary. They just didn't have any interest. Mm -hmm. And then listen to what it says. You know, but when they were in trouble, right? And this this to me ministers me deeply. When they were in trouble, it says, and it says, and they did turn unto the Lord, the God of Israel. In other words, the fact that they, you know, stopped worshiping or 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 following God. It never stopped God being their God. Mm -hmm. He was still their God, you know. And I was having this conversation a few weeks ago with a friend of mine. You know, the fact that you may not feel like you're living the 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 way God intended you to live, it doesn't mean that God kicks you to the curb mm -hmm. and He stops being your God. He you. He still loves you with the same amount of strength, Amen. you know, that that He loved you before. And, and the Scripture kind of anchors itself. And listen to what it says. It says, but when they in their troubles did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. He was found. That's beautiful. You know, that's essential to know that, you know, a lot of times we fear reconciliation with someone because of the rejection that we might get because of our own actions or because of, you know, whatever trauma created the separation. But with God, his arms are always open. Mm-hmm. You know, he's always, he he, he he just wants us to come back. He Bible just said, wants to get to know us. No, the Bible said, if you seek me, you will find me. Yep, the Bible. So, you know, if, if, if we 
do that action to seek God, we're going to find him because he's always there, you know, with his arms open. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, God is, I always tell people when they tell me, I'm just waiting on God. No, you're not. You're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time, not in all the cases, and I'm, I'm very understanding about that, but in most of the time, the people that I do minister, mm -hmm. uh, then, they, then there's, they, they think they're waiting on God, and they're not. God's waiting on them. There are certain things that God depends of us. And, and, and in this particular passage that, that I said earlier ministers me is the, the, the mere fact that God was still their God. The mere fact alone that when they were in their troubles— that kind of provoked them to seek God, and they found Him. Mm -hmm. And and the reason that to me is essential is because if we're honest with ourselves, and I tell this in my church uh, numerous times, there are some people that sometimes we won't even seek God had it not been for the troubles that we go through in life. Yeah. Had it not been for the tribulations, we would not be seeking God. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, um, go ahead, brother. You know, one other thing is, even people that say that atheists, when they are in a hard situation, what's the first thing they do? Oh, God, you know, it, it, <laughs> it's in us already, right? It's still in us. That emptiness that only God could fill, and the Spirit comes and reaches out mm -hmm. uh, to God. And we have to, like, a lot of people don't know how to submit to the Spirit, but God is always trying to find a way that Amen. we could turn to him, and, and even sometimes it could be uh, uh, through hard time, and uh, then God, you know, is always there for us uh, because he loves us. Amen. Uh, brother, I'm going to make a small pause because we just received an important text. Uh, did you, did you go make that phone call? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, she's going to step out for a minute because we just received an, uh, an important text, and I want to make sure that we're able to... Uh, Give it our full attention if that be necessary. But anyway, so yeah, Brother Martinez, that, that's, you know, and, 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 and this is what I think. The Apostle Paul teaches us that sometimes our tribulations are a blessing in disguise because, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the storm, number one, reveals the deepness of our roots with God. Number two, if our roots are not firm, and some of us, it pushes us, I got to pray. I need God. You know, it, at least in me, in my circumstances, you know, when I go through rough waters, I actually end up getting closer to God, you know, because I pray more. I fast more. I need more guidance. I need more, you know, I, I need help. I, I, I recognize that, that without God, I'm nothing. And I quickly just say, you know, I need you. And, and that's what this scripture is kind of anchoring itself on. You know, it's saying that, you know, it's beautiful to know that uh, when in their time of trouble, they seek them, they found them. You know, it's sad that it was in times of trouble, but it's good to know that he is there. And, and if we kind of continue on uh, to the next passage, let me kind of put it up here so that um, the rest of everyone can see it. Uh, listen to what it says. It says, secrets of a successful living. He said, of course, no one can begin to live successfully without knowing God. And first of all, we must understand how we can come to know him for ourselves. And we kind of cover this in the past few Mondays. Says the subject is brought before us in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, and it pinpoints in the above key verses, there is only one true God. We covered this last week. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 or 5, that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one God, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your might, and all your strength. Did you send them an audio message? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, text them a message to let us know what hospital. Uh, okay. So if we have to go after here, we can go. Uh, anyway, so, and then listen to what it says. And the greatest blessing which anyone can experience in this life is to find the true God and the greatest tragedy, which I always anchor myself on this is to live life without never having a personal encounter with God. And, and I'm not talking, and I know I've received criticism sometimes, uh, send it privately. And I, mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm not talking about just simply, uh, 
a, a goosebump relationship with God. And, and let me kind of explain myself what I mean by a goosebump relationship with God. You know, when, when you go to church or when you're in your house praying or whatever the atmosphere or the, wherever the environment may be, that you feel the presence of God comes into the room and you just feel his, in Spanish, I like to call it like las caricias de Dios. You know, God uh, caressing you, I think in English it is, you know, hugging you, you know, giving you encouragement and, and, and you feel that you get goosebumps because, you know, God is near and, and the Bible says, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. That's that's the book of Psalms. So, and that's great. I'm not criticizing that in no manner. On the contrary, I encourage that. But God is deeper than goosebumps. That, that's my point. You know, God is more intimate than goosebumps. If, if, if I could kind of compare it or use an analogy, I remember when my wife and I were 15, uh, when we started dating, I remember we spent one year where we didn't even hold hands. Uh, we were really young. We were probably 14, 15. Uh, my wife was very, how do you say, innocent, you know, for lack of a better word. And, and she honestly thought that, <laughs> she honestly thought that if we would have given a, 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 a kiss, a tap kiss, that she could have got pregnant. So she would allow me near her. So her parents did a phenomenal job raising her <laughs> that at the age of 15, she still believed this. So for one year, we didn't even hold hands. So I remember after that, a year, I was a little bit different. And I'm saying, okay, I got to figure this out because, you know, I've been dating for a year and I can't even hold her hand. So I started slowly easing into it. And I remember I wrote her a poem a Spanish poem, which is probably corny, but I loved it back then. And it said, uh, Del cielo cayó un pañuelo bordado de mil colores y en cada esquina decía miriam de mis amores. And the first letter of each of those words says un beso. I was asking if she would give me a kiss. But this is the point I'm trying to get. Uh, I remember when we first started holding hands, you know, uh, and, you know, it's that first touch and you, you get all goosebumps all over your body. And that little touch, which right now, I, I don't want to sound bad, but we hold hands all the time. And, you know, it, it's not as exciting as the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope that's not offensive to anybody. But but um, but you, if you could well, remember... We passed that stage. Yeah, we kind of passed that stage. If you could remember that those goosebumps, uh, that's the goosebump stage that I'm talking about. But when we got married, and when, you know, we had the honeymoon, I'm going to keep this PG-13, but, you know, we've been married for 25 years. We've definitely taken a different level. That's kind of what I'm referring to about God is more than goosebumps. Mm -hmm. God wants a, a stronger intimacy with us than what, you know, sometimes we honestly think. Uh, and sadly, the world that surrounds us. Brother Ruben, one of the things that Im impacts me about God is that, like you said, um, when you don't know God that well, you don't know, you don't know, uh, you, you, you can't even hear God's voice. But when you have an, an intimacy with God, you can even hear his voice. And sometimes you can even, like, if you close your eyes, you can see that God is, God you. is guiding you where you want him to, where, where you want him to go. Where he wants you to go. Yeah. And we don't, we, you don't have that um, close relationship with God. Sometimes you feel lost. Yeah, I like try to find the way, like trying to see, like okay, which way should I go? But when you have that connection with God, the intimacy that you're saying is so easy to just say, you know what, God opened this door, and I'm gonna go that way because I, I, you know, I feel that you know He was the one that opened it. Like you saw sure and certain it's not like you're not like like what do you say like thinking in, in, you're not in, doubting you're not doubting I, I, one of the conversations you know? we were having earlier today with the sister from the church uh who was kind of telling us that she felt you know that last night god was speaking to her and he gave her you know he told her some instructions yeah. and you know she was kind of explaining to us and i told her sister you know ironically i was speaking to my wife last night about the same topic and I was, you know, kind of asking God, 
to 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 you know to 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 speak to you yeah. in a in a more clear way. Those were my prayers, uh, and 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 she was kind of affirming that you know I felt that God was speaking. Matter of fact, uh, even two Sundays ago, I was in the office with another uh, an individual, and uh, and I was she had, you know, she had used a phrase that someone from the congregation told me. Uh, which was actually you. And when you told me the phrase that she had used, something that she had discernment, it hit me because I had felt the same thing. And and that and I actually invited her to the office and said, Sister, I just want to kind of give you a praise report because the same words you told my wife, I had felt in my yeah. heart. And, uh, and, and that to me, you know, is, uh, give me one second, somebody just connected. And I don't know who it is. My jacket, I think it's Ethan. Yeah, I'm. I just muted them. Um. So anyway, so it it uh, I just wanted to affirm to her, you know, don't I don't want the enemy to put doubts in your mind because the same phrase that God put in your heart, He put in my heart simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, we got Brother Martinez here, and Brother Martinez knows that last Sunday, you know, um, I was I was preaching, and he came up to me and told me, brother. You know, uh, show me a sermon. God speaks to him the same. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's amazing. And when the closer you get to God, the more easier it comes. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. She's getting a phone call from the hospital. I want to make sure everything is good. Anyway, so let's go to the next one. It says in our key verse verses, uh, we have. Go ahead. You want to say something, brother? Yeah, I wanted to say. Uh, yesterday, when I was uh, telling the uh, the news about the. Uh, different authors of the Bible is about 30 different men and they all coincide and said why do they coincide because God is the, the author and when you get into the spirit you can understand uh, the things of the spirit uh, but if you are not in the spirit you can't understand that's why it's important to have that close encounter with God receive the, the spirit of God you, even the apostles the Lord told don't go anywhere until you receive the Spirit of God, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and this is what helps us, that close encounter, that receiving of the Spirit, then we'll be guided by the Spirit to do the things of the Spirit. Now, that's a good point, Brother Martinez, that you bring. And and, I, and I've and talked this... Yeah, go ahead, Brother. Um, so, so, this is so often the case where... I think it happens to all of us where until we're in trouble, until something drastic, till you see that you yourself have no solution, then comes out where as a final resort, you cry out to God because you, you, you're like, I can't figure this out myself. There's no one around me that can bail me out. My aunt can't help me. That, and this is where you're like, you like God help me. I, I'm, I'm. I said I'm done. And when all of a sudden those prayers get answered, you start like, wow, like this is getting real. And as you, and then things get better. You pray, God help you, and now everything is groovy, and you start forgetting again until again you are in trouble. And when that constantly keeps happening, it starts strengthening your faith then for me what happens is all day i'm in constant constant connection god be with me and, and every little move whether i'm in trouble or not you know i could be going and god be with me and and, and you know you, you're, you're constantly uh making that 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 connection and you start your faith becomes stronger and you could almost see those prayers being answered immediately yeah, because you're so, you be, your faith becomes so strong, where you be like, God, I'll be in this situation, and boom, that phone call comes right away, and it's like immediately, you're like there it is, and you already get to the point where you're you're expecting it, you know, he's gonna answer your prayer, and, and so your, your confidence and your faith becomes stronger, and and, and that's it's where it becomes beautiful because that's that that strong relationship. Now it's like, and every move you make. God is a part of, and every little thing is the same. And it, and it, and it's it's what's interesting about it. 
God is, is always you know, part of that, that, that thing. Yeah, and, and what, what, what really hits close to home for me, right, is that had it not been through the rough waters that we may find ourselves swimming in at the time, we would have not gotten that close to God. I mean, I could say it for myself. Had it not been for the rough waters that I had to swim to, I would not be where I find myself to be today with God. And that's what this passage is kind of, you know, what's interesting about this, and I'm going to read the, the next slide really quick because I can't, I think it intersyncs with us, is that this doesn't only relate to the people of Israel 3,000 years ago. This, this, this intertwines with us in the present day. Uh, and, 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 and one of the key things that I think uh, ministers me in, in this history is even though it's describing them, you know, in the present time right now, you could kind of see that this kind of mentality unfolds with us today. Listen to what it says. It says in verse three, it says it tells us that this had been true of them. And it says for a long time, it says they were godless, less God. Um, look up Ephesians 2.12, and then I'm going to read it for you right now. It says, give me one second because I put up the wrong one. Uh, so listen to what Ephesians 2.12 says. It says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aligned from the common wealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God into this world. So what the book of Ephesians is basically saying is it's kind of enlightening them that there was a time in your life that you had no clue of who was God or what God is or any relationship, but circumstances unfolded where they kind of gravitated us towards, hey, there's something out there other than yourself. There's something uh, greater than you. Mm -hmm. And listen to what it says. It says, this is the perfect description. Let me put this up real quick. And I apologize because I'm That's doing two things at once. It says, this is a perfect description of multitude of people today that they're living without God. He does not enter into their thoughts except in times of emergencies. And he has not been welcomed into their lives. And it says the Israelites still believe in the existing of God and they experience and benefit from his providence. But it says for all that they were without a true God. Now, let me kind of, you know, uh, dissect this real quick. Remember that I said earlier that the Israelites were living in a land that God had given them. In other words, they were benefiting from God's blessings. It doesn't mean they didn't believe in God, because a lot of people believe in God. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean that they weren't inclined to lean towards God in rough waters. It doesn't mean that either. But what, it, what God is speaking of is, because listen to the phrase that he uses, that they were without a true God. Mm -hmm. So he did not say that they were without a God. Mm -hmm. He said they were without a true God. Why is this important? Because if we kind of dissect that phrase alone, it lets you know that we all have a God, even atheist. It doesn't matter where you're from. From the definition of the word, I'm not saying, in you know, from the religious perspective of it, from the definition of the word, when we worship something or we adore something or something that, you know, to some people, their kids could be their gods. To other people, it could be their finances. To other people, it could be, you know, Christmas, it could be anything, you know, but whatever, you know, you, you're, you're devoting your whole life to, it could be your goals, you know, you're you, worshiping. Want, you know, you're worshiping it, whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. um, so the, when God approaches them, he tells them, you know, for a long time, they've been without a true God. The temple was there. They were still living under the law of Moses, but they were just lacking that encounter. And that's what God was kind of letting them know. You're, 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 you're breathing in my blessing. You know, you're walking on my blessing. You're, 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 you're eating my blessing. You're living under my protection, but you have the land that I gave you, but I'm not allowed to live it with you. Mm -hmm. 
Think about it. Now, let, let me... Like a, a, a lot of them were adoring the temple, uh, uh, but not the God of the temple. Yeah, but that's that's... That kind of, you know, sums it up. Listen to what verse 3 says. It says, we are not told. Well, I already covered that. But I, I want to cover the part where it says, you know, when when uh, when Satan kind of come, comes into the picture in the Garden of Eden. So I'm going to jump forward real quick because I'm not running out of time. It says, uh, with the earliest history of man, Satan has began his efforts to deceive our race. Speaking of the human race. It says, who, he says, he who had incited rebellion in heaven desires to bring in to the inhabitants of the earth to unite with him against his warfare against the government of God. So let me dissect it real quick. Basically, Satan has an issue with God. From the beginning, before we were around, you know, he had his, his issues with God. I'm not going to get into that. Um, and it created a separation. Now, when he sees that God has created this perfectly beautiful Eden, mm -hmm. right? Where Adam and Eve were at. And now he's saying, wait a second. You know, I want that. Why can't I have that? And he starts to slowly and manipulously or manipulatively uh, kind of sneak his way into it and say, if I'm able to take that away from God, mm -hmm. so keep this in mind, we are literally a product of somebody else's battle. In other words, God created us for him. But Satan, you know, said, that's not good. I want to deceive you. So let me kind of uh, dissect the strategy that the enemy used in uh, when he approached Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. In the Garden of, of Eden. Listen, listen to this. I, I think this is, uh, uh, is important. I'm going to put it up so that people on social media can see it. It says, the only one who promised Adam life in disobedience was the great deceiver. And the declaration of the serpent to Eve in the Eden. Listen to what it says. Ye shall not surely die. Keep in mind that God had previously spoke to Adam and Eve and told him, don't touch the tree of life. Leave it alone. Because if you do, you'll okay. surely die. Now here comes the manipulation where Satan says, you shall surely not die. Now, was the first, this was the first sermon preached upon the immortality of a soul. Listen to this. This was the first sermon ever preached upon immortality of a soul. Satan was telling Eve, you won't die. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. God is being deceitful to you. And he goes on and says, yet this declaration rests solely upon the authority of Satan and is echoed from pulpits of Christian churches today. And is received by majority of mankind as ready and as it was received by our first parents, referring to Adam and Eve. And it says, the divine sentence that God has said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It speaks about it in Ezekiel 18, 20 as well. Is made to mean by Satan, the soul that sinneth shall not die, but every but live eternally. We cannot but wonder that the strange infatuation which renders to men to actually believe or concerning the words of Satan is so unbelievably to disregard what God had previously said. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is take us back to the beginning when Satan painted a picture to Adam and Eve when they were in the Garden of the Inn and said, if you, if you touch the fruit, you won't die. They knew God had said, don't touch the fruit. Now, a lot of times we interpret this as God had the conversation with them yesterday, and then the very next day, Satan came into the picture. The Bible does not give us a timeline. We don't know how long they were in the Garden of Eden. We don't know how many years had passed. We really, it does not give you a timeline. All we know is that God said, you will die. Satan said, you won't die. And the sad part about the story is that Adam and Eve started to entertain the thought mm -hmm. that the author of deceitfulness had told him. Why is this important? Because even in the generation we live today, you know, men seem to believe that we will be immortal even though we live without God. Mm -hmm. Let me kind of explain this a little bit further. You know the story. Almost everybody knows the story of the Garden of Eden. You know, after they sin, God push, pushes them out of the Garden of Eden and he puts an angel, in Spanish it's called a querubim, 
you know, to protect the entrance with a fired sword. Now, the purpose of the angel that's protecting the Garden of Eden, right? Let's pretend I got my three little sculptures here. God puts an angel to protect the entrance into the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve can't get access. No human being can get access into the Garden of Eden. Now, why is this important to, for God? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because he intentionally placed it there because if Adam and Eve was to gain access to the Garden of Eden, sin would be immortal. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Because of their sin, men became mortal. Mm -hmm. And God pushed them out of the Garden of Eden. Yeah. So God now tells them, you can't come access to me anymore because now you've tainted yourself. Sin creates a separation. And, and, and this is important for us to kind of dissect it because sin will always create a separation between us and God. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have light and darkness. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Either you have it on or you have it off. And there's no in between. And, and what the enemy managed to do is he managed to put a wedge between God right where he needed to and men. And it was through sin. That's why we have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. now the message changes. We've been redeemed. Yeah. In other words, we've once again gained access to God. And the interesting part about the gospel of Christ is that God knows that we're going to sin. We are sinners. Mm -hmm. God knows that Mary's been serving the Lord practically her whole life. Uh, but God knows that she's going to sin tomorrow and the next day and the next day. God knows I'm going to make mistakes. God knows we're all, he knows this. That's why he sent the redemption plan of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and created a pathway where now we have access mm -hmm. to be redeemed. And why is this important? Well, because through that access, we find God. What, 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 what's the key to this? The key is repentance. Mm -hmm. The key is acknowledgement. There's a passage that I love, and I'm going to close with this. And it's about, uh, it's called the prodigal son. And uh, the Bible says in the story that, you know, this this, this son, you know, he, he goes up to his dad and he tells dad, give me all my inheritance. Give me everything that's mine. I'm sick of being in your house. I want to go. I want to do my own thing. If you have kids, you know what that feels like if they're in their teen years. So, uh, and he left. He went his way. And he lived life how he thought he wanted to live it. What happened? You know. And, and this goes back to what Eli was saying. He, when he finds himself desiring to eat what the swines were eating, when he finds himself at the lowest pivot point of his life, he says, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of reacts and says, I can't believe this. Look how low I've come. Mm -hmm. When in my father's house, you know, there, there's so many blessings. I have no reason to be here. I have no reason to be in this situation that I find myself. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Now God comes and says, okay, well, um, and, and this is what ministers me. He, the Bible says that he says, in other words, you know, he recognized his mm -hmm. condition. He identified it. And what did he say? He started rehearsing his repentance. He started saying, I will go to my father and I will tell my father, I have sinned before you and before God, forgive me, you know, and make me just one of your servants. I don't deserve to be your son. Mm -hmm. So not only did he rehearse how he was going to repent to his dad and God, but he also humbles himself by saying, I don't deserve to be one of your sons. Mm -hmm. And that alone, that simple expression catastrophically opened a door for him where when he got home, if you know the story, the father didn't care about what he did, his actions, he didn't care. He did exactly what God did to the people of Israel, like in the first scripture that we read. You know, mm -hmm. the father gave him a ring, changed his clothes, put on a good gar a new garment, you know, threw a feast, celebrated. He said, you know, I'm just happy that you're here. And when God approaches Israel in the book of Second Chronicles, he tells them, hey, listen, you guys have been living quite a long time without a true God. You forgot. I gave you the land. 
I gave you the air that you breathe. You forgot. All the blessings in your life come from me. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, everything is, is I'm blessing you, and yet you have no time for me. And that's what he's saying in the scripture. You know, I'm giving you everything that I can. I answer prayers, like Brother Eli was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when we in these situations, we, we we kind of talk to God and we and we start to realize, man, God is answering me. God answered my prayers. God talked to me. And, and that's wonderful. And, and I encourage that to every single one of us. But, you know, we also, uh, I, I'm, I'm basically what I'm saying is I'm putting out a call that even though um, we have a relationship with God, there's always room to strengthen that relationship even more, to get a little bit closer to God. You know, even, and I always use the, the, the scripture that I love, the story with Moses, a man that he saw the, the Red Sea was parted. He saw, you know, all the signs and wonders that God did. He saw the burning bush. I mean, he, he saw bread come from the heavens. He saw so many miracles, so many. He spoke face to face with God several occasions. He would go into the mountains for 40 days. So many things. But at the end of his ministry, his one of his last petitions were, God, I want more. God, I, I, I want to see you closer. I want to have more, uh, you know, uh, I want to see your glory. And, and when I read that passage that he says, I want to see your glory, I'm saying, wow, this is a man that had already seen, you know, a huge catastrophic level of, 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 of God. And yet he's saying, I want more. I want more. And, and, and my, I guess my word today or my, my, my advice today is, you know, are we really hungry for God? Are we really hungry for an intimate relationship with God? That's the key to finding God. That's the key to, to getting to know, to getting to that place where God wants us to be. Uh, I see Amen. you got your Bible. Yeah. There's a scripture that always, uh, and there's also a Christian song that um, I used to listen to when I was young. And it just brought me uh, memories. Amen. And uh, we can find it in Luke um, 6.46, right? And it says, And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not do, and do not, what? I don't know. If can, what what, what it. verse is it? 46. 46, okay. It says, why, and why call ye me, mm -hmm. Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I which say. Which I say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, I'll let, I'll let you go ahead. So, one of the things that I, uh, you know, it just, um, I started thinking, right, about the, the verse, is that uh, always, God has always, like, wants, wants to be part of, of our life. 100%. You know, and sometimes we just look for God only when, um, when we're passing through a struggle or when we need something. You know, oh my gosh, this happened. God, I need you. God, help me. Yeah. But I don't think God wants a relationship like that with us. I think God wants us to feel part of our life, like always be there for us. Always like, if you, like feel like a father with a son or like with a, a daughter. Figure, yeah. That when that when they're doing when they are doing good, you know, you get happy with your kids. Like, you know, oh my God. You know, there's, so, there's nothing more you know, beautiful than when your kids come to you and ask you for advice. Yeah. As a father, I could say that. I love it when my kids come, you know, and vent out and talk to me. I feel like I'm an important figure in their life. To me, that means a lot. Uh, and I can only imagine that's that's how God feels. Yeah. He, I can he, only imagine that, that that's... He wants to feel the same success. Like, like when your own kids have the same success, you know, or, or you feel happy. God always wants to feel part of the, 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 the scripture the that you read, it's in the book of Luke chapter 6. And it says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but yet do not do the things that I do? So he's referring to, he's actually speaking to the Christian body. Yeah. He's speaking, he's speaking to the disciples and, the, and he's saying, you call me Lord. But you don't you don't follow me. You don't yeah. you don't you don't do the things I do. I, I told you, uh, yeah. and, and and I'm a firm believer that God is constantly calling us, calling us, calling us. There's a scripture that I'm gonna read it real quick if I if I could And another thing, Brother Ruben, um that I was uh, um thinking, you know, that 
back in the days, I remember that um, uh, when I used to go to school many years ago, um, I, I used to like we and my friends in uh in, in in school. We used to read the Bible because there was like a a little group of Christians like us. And we used to read the Bible and everything, but then I started seeing that everything started changing. And, every, you know, they started taking the Bibles, they started taking the, the, the prayers. And through high school, all I was seeing was uh, a lot of girls being pregnant, a lot of drugs and a lot of things going on. And, and now that I'm, you know, older and I, I start thinking, you know, I'm like, you know, if, if you take God out of your life, or you took out of out of school, you know, what do you think is going to happen? You know, God is not going to be there no more. You're pushing yeah. God away, you know, and, and that's one of the sad things that I it's, it's been going on. You, you eliminated God out of the equation, but you blame him when things go wrong. Because uh, I get a lot of phone calls and people tell me when there's a tragedy, where was God? Uh, it's, it's a you know very famous phrase for those who you know attack the church and they hey, where was God where was God where was God well he definitely wasn't in the school because we kicked him out yeah. you know um, so he definitely yeah. wasn't there I, I want to read a quick scripture in the book of Romans chapter eight give me one second brother Martinez I'll send you right now listen to what it says it says and the spirit it says itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God so let me let me dissect that. This is Romans chapter 8, verse, uh, what verse was that that I was reading? Verse 16. It says, the Spirit, referring to the Spirit of God, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What is that saying? Is that this kind of goes close to what Brother Eli was saying earlier, that God's Spirit is speaking to us inside of us because we are children of God. When, when you took the breath of life, the breath of life, you inhaled. That life. air that you took in was the life, was what gave you the spirit, which is a part of God. The Bible says that when Adam was birthed or when Adam was created, there was only nothing but a corpse up until God gave him breath. the breath of life. life. That breath came from God. That's why it says that our spirit bears witness. It speaks to God. It, you know, it yearns for God. And in this chapter, what highlights my attention is that it says that it yearns for God as a woman in labor. Mm -hmm. That's how much our spirits desires God. And this is what it says furthermore. It says, and if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so, that he suffers. And it says, for I reckon that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Mm -hmm. Remember when we initiated, we were speaking about that sometimes tribulations push us towards God. Listen to what the apostle is saying in the book of Romans. He's saying that the afflictions of the present and the suffering of the present times cannot compare to the glory that shall be revealed in us. What does that mean? That means that the affliction that drove me through God can't be compared to the glory that I'm going to find when I get to God, mm -hmm. when I make that connection, when I have that encounter, which is what the brother Eda was saying earlier. You kind of realize, man, God is answering prayers. God is talking to me. And, and listen to what he says. He says, for the yearnest expectations of the creation, it says, waiteth for the manifestations of the Son of God. And it says, for the creature was made subject to vanities, not willingly, but for the reasons of him who hates subject him to that. So, listen to what is it? Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage of the corruption. Now, let me kind of dissect verse 20 where it says, for the creature is subject. And then it says, and yearnest the, the, the earliest expectations of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of God. So what it's saying is, is that when it says the creature is referring to us, and it's saying that our spirit is waiting, it's yearning for that connection with God. It's like it's like a thirst that nothing you know is going to satisfy but a good cold glass of water. Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible says that our spirit 
yearns for that connection. Why? Why is there something in every man that they desire to know if God's real or not? And I always challenge people with this and say, if, if, if Santa Claus is not real, and I don't see no one creating a fuss about it. So if you really don't believe God is real, then so be it. Live your life and enjoy it. Why do you fight us so much? To, to, why is that? Where is that coming from? And, and from a biblical perspective, the book of Romans tells us that there is a yearning inside there, yeah. every human being, and it's his spirit that wants to connect with the spirit that created him. Remember, the breath of life came from Christ, came from God. You know, and that's what get that that's a connection. And I always use this phrase when I speak about Romans. In every human being, I don't care how corrupt you may think he is, there is a fragment of God. And it's his spirit. That is not an earthly born thing. That's a heavenly thing. That's why the Bible says that the spirits after we die return to God who gave them. Because, you know. What we see here, this is our physical form. And the only purpose of it is so that you can see us, so we can interact. But what you're seeing is not really me. The spirit inside me, that's my conscience. That's who I am as an individual. When I think, when I, when I, when I process, when I make decisions, that's who I am. That's my deity from a spiritual perspective. Uh, and that yearns to connect with God. Martina. Martina was going to say something. I'm sorry, brother. You left them, in, yes, you left them say, black. <laughs> uh, if you have been lost physically, uh, the, you get a strength from your way, and uh, and you can't find a way. You go into an anxiety. You go into despair. Yeah. And then when you finally yeah. find your right path, uh, you feel that relief. That's the same with God. Uh, we are working in, in, in a world that a lot of times we find ourselves lost. But when we find the Lord, we get on the right path. We receive that relief because that's the path that God wants us in. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely, brother. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I want to just quickly, uh, you know, it's already 9.30. I already stole two minutes from you guys. I want to do a special prayer for uh, a, a message that we received from someone that they're in the hospital. And we may actually have to go visit them when we get out of this meeting. Uh, but anybody else has a petition that you want us to pray for? Uh, you, you're more than welcome to place it before, uh, bring it before the table now. Yeah, my brother Vicente, he's in the hospital. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray for Vicente as well. Uh, brother, uh, Sister um, Alicia and Brother Juan, they're in the hospital now. Let's pray for them as well. Hey, hey, Ruben, I don't know if you noticed, but I believe we have uh, uh, June with us. Which, oh, you know, no, I didn't notice. Came, uh, overcame. You know, the, the, he's still a little bit in the battle, but he, he's with us right now. I That's believe good. he's still there. Yeah, love you, man. Uh, um, he's my, uh, uh, I have a lot of memories with with, with, my, with Junito. Uh, uh, I, I, I was the one that when my mom was actually sick and my dad, our family was separated. Uh, when I was like, I don't know how old I was. He probably remembers better than I do. Uh, <clears throat> I was sent to live with Titi Alija, who was a block away from their house. So they were the three cousins that I had more fellowship with, which was Junito, Telly, and myself. And my brother was in Puerto Rico, and my uh, sister was in the Bronx. Junito, love you, man. Thank you for connecting with us. Hey, I love you guys, too. I appreciate it. Sorry I came on late. Nah, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry about it. From here, my wife is here, and we enjoyed uh, everything you were going on. And over. we know that God answered prayers, Junito, because... Yeah, we were man. praying for you a lot. And we were praying for you, yeah. And thank God that, uh, you know, I we have you. Yeah, it's good to hear you, man. It's good to hear from you. And, and I know I know things are going to get back on track and going to get better than they were before. Like we were saying earlier, the affliction, the affliction, I'm sorry, the suffering of the present time does not compare to the glory that is going to reveal itself within us. And and right there, you have a perfect example. I'm um, glad to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do a quick prayer uh, to kind of dismiss. If anybody has a petition, feel free to present it. Once again, I want to mention we have a, we just got a, a, an emergency phone call. Uh, let's keep them in prayer. Amen. Um, and uh, that God may, you know, may, 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 you know, take control. When the doctors say that, that, that when the doctors bring discouraging news, we still have one more resource that we could go to, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's do a quick prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your presence and your word. We pray that you continue, Lord, 
to enlighten us, to shine your glory and the power of your wisdom within us. We pray that your word may be implemented and, and applied to our lives, that, that it may we may meditate in it during the course of the week. We pray for all those who have presented petitions. We pray for those who watch us on social media. We pray for those who are in the hospital, Father. We pray for Sister Juan, Sister Alicia. We pray for uh, Brother Vicente in Puerto Rico. We pray that you take control, Father, that you may have the last word. And we pray for those who are not present, doesn't matter what the circumstance may be, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we believe in the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray that it may be a test, uh, prayer today, but a testimony for tomorrow. In the name of Jesus, Father, amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you guys. Love you guys all. My apologies. I got to run. I got to kind of, you know, we have to address something. But, hey, Felix, once again, love you, man. Thank you for connecting. Amanda, Thank you, God everybody. Bless you. Amanda, Gabriel, Gabriel, Martinez, Eloy, Palacare, Judy, Judy, Judy. Everybody that's Eloy. connected. Thank you for connecting, okay? God bless everybody. Also, you know, God bless all those who connect with us through social media. Thank you uh, for, you know, just being a part of our ministry, our lives. And you know, it's always a blessing to have everyone here with us. God bless you.